<laughs> sit in our respective. Uh... It's under my face. All right. <laughs> Okay, all settled? Sure. Wonderful, so welcome to Data Dump. It is my pleasure to be moderating this session today. Fantastic slew of panelists here. And uh, I've been told I need to make it snappy. So without any introductions, <laughs> I'm just gonna launch straight in. So data, data everywhere. There's so much of it today. But the question is, you know, how are we actually using it? How are we using it to facilitate knowledge sharing to make the uh, process of building more efficient, to make our cities more livable? All of these questions, I think we're still struggling to understand. And so I'd like to start with perhaps Archana, as our only public sector official in the program today, I believe. You know, would you like to start by giving us the perspective of the government on data? Sure, so no pressure. Um, so I'll speak for the entire government, um, just kidding. Um, so I work at the Department of Buildings. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Strategic Planning and Policy. That's all I'm gonna say in the way of introduction because otherwise we're not allowed. Joking. Um, so uh, basically, Buildings is an interesting place. I've been there for about four years. Um, when I got there, um, learned uh, that buildings, like many city agencies, particularly those that are regulatory agencies, have just massive quantities of data. So we, when I arrived, were operating on a 30-year-old mainframe system. We are still in that system. We're sort of in a process of transitioning out of that system. But the most sort of fascinating thing about it is that it's this incredibly antiquated technology that over the last 30 years has been built upon and built upon sort of like coral in a way that is in incredibly difficult to kind of dive into and understand and sort of spread out in a way that can be transparent. <clears throat> what that means is it's really hard to replace. But what that also means is that there's just a massive quantity of data in there. So I think government has always, well, certain parts of government have done a really great job of collecting and maintaining data. A lot of times for reasons that are about you know, accountability, about reporters calling and asking for something and to make sure that we didn't do something bad or corrupt. Um, so the data protects us and we've always sort of seen it that way. Um, and I'm sure folks are familiar with the open data movements of more recent years and I think that buildings has been um, I think a really robust partner in that effort. Um, lots, of, lots of cultural change was required to get us to this point. Um, as I mentioned, um, as a regulatory agency, buildings can be a bit hunkered down and a bit afraid to share our data. Um, our data can be used against us. Um, it often is. Um, however, that's part of our job, right? Government's job, you know, we keep the data and we keep it for a lot of reasons, but it's not our data. We're not different from everybody else. We're funded by taxpayers. It's our job to share that data back with the taxpayers. So something that I've really championed in my time at Buildings, and I know that um, other, other folks have really um, done a lot of work to support this effort, is to really publish a lot of our data in open data. Um, that's a platform that exists in New York City and in many other cities. Um, it's on different technology, but in New York City, it's basically a place where there are spreadsheets of data that are published, sometimes even as frequently as daily or hourly. Um, ours is mostly daily. Um, and that data becomes available to anybody who can sort of uh, click on the website and export the data into a spreadsheet and play around with it. Um, it's not the most user-friendly in the sense that you have to have a little bit of a sense of how to navigate that data to be able to use it, but we make it available because it's not really ours. It's, it's ours DOB, it's ours the world's, you know, ours the public's. So um, massive amounts of data is available. Um, and the other really sort of critical thing that we're doing is coming from a mainframe, antiquated mainframe system, data is pretty limited, pretty unstructured. It's there, it's just hard to get to it, it's hard to understand it. So as we're modernizing and rolling out new functionality in this program that we're calling DOB Now, which is where 100% of transactions will be conducted once the program is completed, um, each release comes with a massive amount of additional fields, meaning that we can structure the data, publish the data, and explain the data more effectively than we ever have been able to before. So I think we really see it as, you know, this is, this is our job, this is part of the mandate to share this, just like it's our job to share public information about, you know, specific filings or permits or what have you. So Wonderful. that's sort of the rundown. Government as provider of data. Yeah. Government <laughs> as the aggregator and the information source. 
Um, before we go to the other panelists, just one question for, for the group, actually. How do you, what, what kinds of data is available and how do you um, use it for the built environment? Any reflections? You want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I, I can start. So we're, we're a software provider that digitizes a lot of currently paper and Excel-based uh, workflows on job sites. So payroll, timekeeping, production tracking, daily construction reports, compliance. And so we generate a ton of data around uh, the construction process. So, you know, I think, um, you know, it's useful to architects and designers to understand the constructability of their designs to provide a feedback loop there. Uh, I think the cost aspect of the data is something that uh, for the owners and developers is, uh, creates an opportunity to use that data to rethink about contract structures. Uh, Professor Bernstein talked about it earlier, uh, kind of moving to value-based and outcome-based uh, contracts. And I think uh, data creates an unbelievable opportunity ahead of us to do that. I think we've seen that um, when cities open up data catalogs, mm -hmm. that um, probably the, the buildings and property data is maybe, if not the most used data or most uh, valuable to the um, to the private sector um, than than anything else. I mean, there, there's been a, you know a lot of different data sets that are opened up. Um, I would say the other thing that might take the lead beyond uh, property data is uh, government salary data uh, that people want to look up what you know their government officials are making and what the mayor makes or you know certain employees. But other than that, I think that. Uh, property data where you have some of the best use cases of technology companies accessing that data and then creating business models out of that as well. I think when you talk to cities about um, their open data programs, they'll often point to um, you know company, tech companies that have you know sort of created um, you know search engines or created um, you know tools to uh, be able to leverage that, that property data. And Chris, you've uh, started. A data movement or a data company as well, haven't you? Uh, we about have. How you you use that? We have. So uh, I know part of this part of this panel is about procurement, and we deal um, with the actual um, inner workings of government procurement. Um, we think that it's um, insane. I think it would, a couple times uh, the definition of insanity was given, so I don't need to give that again. But um, we consider uh, repeated RFPs, RFIs, and government processes happening in peer cities, maybe you know, neighboring cities, or even within departments for the same exact technology, uh, very similar requirements um, that do not um, share information with each other is, um, is quite insane, frankly. And so um, we believe that if a, a fair and transparent open process was run in um, one part of the world, um, that the assets from that process should be collected and shared with other um, government entities around the world. And so we've developed a platform that does aggregate um, vendors, it aggregates uh, the um, case, case studies and references of who they've worked with, and then it aggregates actually the contracts, pricing, terms, and conditions associated with those deals, and then um, shares that information with other members, other cities that are on our platform. Um, and it's free for cities to use. Um, and we actually were born out of, um, out of the need within New York City itself. So we were working with the Mayor's Office of Technology and Innovation, um, who, are, who are seeing these challenges in the city itself, and they actually um, helped fund uh, the development of the original platform. So is the transparency given by data and the degree of um, and, and technology changing the way the government procures? Is that um, what you're starting to see? I think so. Are you seeing that? Yeah. Well, I would, I would say, I've said this before, government tends to lag be behind innovations that are happening in other sectors. And, and it's a frustrating reality um, of limited funds, um, concerns about risk taking. Um, so, so I. Yes, certainly there has been a lot of progress made, I think particularly for human service types of contracts, um, maybe less so on the other side of you know, the regulatory and the infrastructure types of agencies. However, uh, that idea is one that I think is immensely appealing, and I think that one thing that I've, I love about working in government is that there's such a spirit of collaboration and sharing um, you know, across city agencies, across departments of buildings, um, so there's this kind of you know, the sense that we can all build off of each other's experiences and successes and failures so that we can learn and do better, um, which is something you don't get in a lot of other sectors. So I think there's a, a right. real hunger most, for that. Most other sectors you don't find. You yeah. know, if you're selling to the energy sector, you know, and Chevron is investing in some new technology, they're not going to go and tell Shell what they just bought. Exactly. You know? um, but in government, you will have cities, especially peer groups, that will share information around what they're using and what they're um, 
uh, performance was. But historically, the, the information is relatively um, contained and tribal within like, your, your, your own personal network. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's amazing that there's no shortage of either technology products or consultants or lobbyists that will go tell you um, what available uh, contracts there are that you can go sell your product to. Um, but go try to find a database of past performance, you know, th where, you know, that doesn't really exist. And so we're, we're trying to do something like that. And, um, and it's, it's amazing that, that government has actually been much more open and willing to share information. We haven't gotten to the point of reviews the way you'd find on Yelp or TripAdvisor or something like that. But, um, you know, the, the government is actually, you know, very willing to kind of show that that past performance information. Yeah, it also raises this other kind of interesting dynamic that happens in government where sometimes your contract or your vendor is sort of an extension of your own workforce, right? So like major technology projects, typically you've got a, a, team, a vendor that comes on board with like you know 50 staff, 20 staff, whoever they are. Those staff are basically working for you. And so it creates this dynamic of um, being able to, so there's a Vendex review, sorry to get into the weeds here, um, but it's a, it's a process by which all city agencies are asked to sort of rate their contractors, their vendors. Um, you know, you want to give them good ratings because you want to maintain that relationship and you want to kind of not destroy their potential future business. And so I think the idea of sort of having a softer way to sort of give feedback that isn't going to, you know, totally destroy the future of a, of a pretty good vendor, mm -hmm. you know, that might be a sort of a good, uh, a good innovation yeah. as well. Yeah. Yeah. Zach, as a, as a private sector <laughs> startup, uh, what are you seeing in terms of procurement changes, whether not from the government or from the private sector as you go out with your solution? Yeah, one of the definitely uh, trends that I've noticed is an increased um, attention to data ownership uh, specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, who owns that data? Do I own it? Do you as the vendor own it? What are you going to be doing with this data? Um, and it's good. I, I think that's, those are questions that need to be asked um, because there are lots of business models out there that survive off people not being aware how their data is being used. Um, and so certainly both in the private and, and public sector, uh, increased attention to what data is being generated, who owns it, uh, where is it being kept uh, for future um, reference if necessary or to be harvested. And so uh, certainly seeing a shift in that direction, which I think is very positive. Yeah, there's a lot of awareness now around kind of data protection yep. uh, as you kind of start using a lot of these cloud-based solutions. So you raised a good thing around um, who owns the data, <laughs> who gets access to the data, at what time? And that raises this questions of the, the value of data and then the standards governing it. <laughs> and coming back to standards, you know, another classical role of the government mm -hmm. is to actually set standards for things. Do you see a role for the government in setting different kinds of data standards? So if we take construction, um, that would be standards around uh, performance, uh, operational performance, build performance. You know, we're all very familiar with standards in manufacturing and building performance, but other standards that perhaps you weren't able to set in the past because you didn't have the information available. How do you see the role of government as the standard setter and potentially regulator? So I would say that the challenge there is that government is very nuanced mm -hmm. and everybody has different missions, right? So, so we as DOB, um, you know, are collecting certain data points and they're interesting to us because we want to know about what, what floor the work is happening on mm -hmm. and, um, you know, what the impacts of that work are going to be structurally, let's say, versus the Department of Environmental Protection who is concerned about asbestos disturbance within the building. So our vantage points are different. So when we try to sort of look at the same, so we're both looking at the floors, but we're looking at them for different reasons. And so if they don't match, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it makes this kind of idea of a, of a universal standard for data a little bit more challenging because the unit of measurement is sort of different. Yep. So to me, it feels like it's really our role to be very clear about what the data means, um, to, to sort of communicate effectively what we're pulling in and to communicate even more effectively what we're pushing out. I think the, you know, we've always been pretty good at communicating with our industry around what, what we're looking for, I think. Um, but I think that the real challenge has historically been for government that when you start publishing data sets, there's a real weakness around data dictionaries and around definitions. And so people are taking in all this data and they don't understand what it means and they're sort of making a lot of assumptions, which can be troublesome for them and for us. Um, so 
I think it's a it's a bit of a mixed responsibility, but I also I think it's um, it's challenging to sort of get to the level of detail and to provide it the resources that it really needs. Yeah, I think a lot of times we even see um, issues with data ownership even within the cities themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, there are even uh, various departments that have rich data sets um, that they hold very closely, and you know they don't necessarily want to share uh, with their peers. And oftentimes they go, they'll go you know, and around and, and submit like a FOIA request into a different department just to be able to get a certain uh, data set that another department has. Not New York City, I'm sure. But, um, <laughs> We're perfect. Yeah, but, um, but I will say as, with respect to New York City that um, our experience with the chief technology officer's office is that they've written a standard of their own for data privacy for the city and they've actually opened that up to um, anyone else who's interested in also adopting it. Um, and the, the city had, had um, also done that around uh, the Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. They wrote uh, standards guidelines for, uh, for IoT and then promoted that out. And there were a number, um, number of other cities around the world that also adopted those standards. So um, a lot of people do look to need, like, cities like New York and other um, very large cities to uh, drive the market in that way. So they look and see what they're doing and then they like to uh, sort of follow on with what they're doing. And New York has done a good job of stepping up kind of creating the data, pri data I mean, privacy. How surprising, yeah. New York City is leading the cities of the world, yeah. isn't it? So that's very fascinating. So New York has now set all the standards. It's actually kind of communicated outwards to the other cities around exactly what they expect from Right, them. the issue is that you get is adoption. You know, yeah. it's just you get um, user, user adoption. I think, Zach, you probably have seen working with, with cities. It's, it's a different uh, process and different expectations with every single different city that you work in. So yeah, like certainly there are, um, yeah, cities that are taking the lead, but it really comes to, uh, you know, getting that, getting the word out and getting communication. So. I think it goes back to standards, and that's where I think the federal versus state and city, um, uh, the roles that each of them play in, in setting data standards is going to be very instrumental in our future uh, as an industry. Um, you know, we heard this morning uh, Rit talking about uh, data standards and establishment of a data trust. So, you know, the Toronto data standards may be different than the New York data standards. They're different than the San Francisco data standards. Um, yet contractors do work across states, um, so that could complicate it. And you've got countries like the UK, Australia, Dubai, who have mandated, you know, BIM level 200 requirements for publicly funded uh, projects. So I think there's a good opportunity for government to lead. Um, if not, then I think you're going to see the private sector companies like Google jumping in to say, hey, we'll, we'll help out here, uh, which, which could be a good or a bad thing, uh, but it's just a choice that we have. Speaking of private sector, have you seen those standards coming out in private sector procurement? Um, so private sector, uh, some are defaulting to some more standard, especially with respect to cybersecurity, SOC 1, SOC 2 compliance, looking at a lot of the standards that have been passed, specifically in like financial services industries, uh, other industries that have been generating data uh, for a long, lot longer than we have in the building industry. Um, and so, yeah, there, there are certainly um, not everyone, but I would say the, the most progressive kind of leading firms are beginning to look at what other standards, specifically around um, cybersecurity policy. Um, beyond that, I haven't seen it too much. It's interesting. So if we cast our minds into the future, and a, a number of us here are like sort of involved in actually seeing where that future is and where it might go, where do you think it's going to go from a data uh, accessibility, data standards, uh, and procurement perspective, which is the three aspects we've spoken about so far? Uh, well, I would say that I think right now, um, the access and ownership of data is too closely tied to cost, okay. um, to, to, to price. So um, oftentimes I think that uh, the customer, in this case uh, public sector, um, in order to achieve a lower cost from whoever, you know, the technology or the vendor that they're working with, um, they give, they're giving up rights to their data mm -hmm. so that vendor can go and monetize that data in some other way. Um, and so and I, I see that all the time. And so I think that that's a, it's a risky um, path that, um, that the industry is in to where you know, they, you know, either they use a, they use a platform uh, at no charge or a lo lower charge in order to, um, to give up access to this information. And then you have all this um, sort of vendor collected data, which, which is kind of a different data set than, um, than cities are publishing on their open data portals. Right? Right? What goes to open data portals is a lot of what's being generated through normal city operations. But then you have vendor collected data um, that is about, you know, the city is hiring a vendor to um, perform some function, 
that vendor is holding on to that data. The city might have an agreement with that vendor of what they can do with that data, and that's what I mean, it's sort of tied to cost, but then how does that data actually get back to citizens? How does it get back to the city and then back through the open data uh, channels as well? So I think it's sort of two challenges there. One. So you almost see the value of data and the recognition that data itself has value and how do you monetize that potentially changing? Because as you say, today it's been given up for free. Mm -hmm. Um, now, obviously, there is a cost in aggregating, cleaning, storing, and, and all of that, right, which the individual may not be able to bear. So you see that shifting into new business models that might actually, you know, data in exchange for something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, lower price of access, for example. How do you, um, certainly with the cities publishing and the government publishing all the data outside, what does the private sector, you know, do with the data, what does it pay to access for that data? You know, those kinds of questions come into consideration, it sounds mm -hmm. like. I think what we're also finding is that the data is complex and yeah. <clears throat> being able to get access to it isn't enough. Right. So the starting point is I can see it, but if it's not sort of structured in a way that is consumable by a normal person, yeah. then there's gonna be an intermediary. And in the case of the building industry, those intermediaries can make a lot of money. Yep. So, you know, one thing that we think about a lot is should we be doing a better job of creating a product so that, you know, um, people in the world don't need to pay somebody to use our data more effectively. And I think our goal is to definitely advance the way we present our data. But on the other hand, the, the companies that take our data and create tools um, for uh, tenants or for apartment seekers or for whoever, um, insurance companies around construction safety, mm -hmm. um, you know, those aren't, those aren't, those are our partners. Um, and so when they come to us and they say, you know, um, we love this data set, but we'd like for you to add X, Y, and Z things, we're like, great, we're going to try to do that. Um, there's all kinds of resource issues that are at play and all of that. But, um, you know, for us, it's um, if, if the information is out there to the public, that's step one, but making the information actually usable by the public in whatever the sort of sectors um, exist, um, that's, that's even better. That's a better outcome for us. That's interesting. So you see potentially the role of the government moving from just being the provider of data to actually taking a role in making, harnessing that data, making it into a product, and then I want to say cutting out the middleman, but it sort of sounded a little bit like that, didn't it? I think that's always been the intention yeah. of, well, let's, I'm going to just talk about DOB. I'm not going to talk broadly about yeah. the role of government because I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> but um, for DOB, historically, despite the fact that we've had a 30-year-old mainframe, we have a system that has property profiles. So you can type in an address and gather a massive amount of information in a pretty let's say, ugly interface, um, but it's there. And if you know how to use it, you can get a massive amount of information. Um, what we're trying to do is figure out how to modernize that to make it more user-friendly, to create a sort of notifications tool so that if you want to sign up for, for updates on five buildings, that you could get them emailed to you. These are not super innovative solutions. These things exist everywhere. It's just the process for us to get from this 30-year-old mainframe and this like sort of historic lack of investment in advancing the technology to just what would be like a very basic function. That's a very long pathway. Mm -hmm. and, and what I'm sort of trying to say is absolutely, you're hearing me right that I think eventually we would like to be able to help people not have to pay for access to our data. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we see that's a very long runway. And I think that there are lots of firms out there that are doing a really great job of harnessing that data and making it really effective for the people who are willing to pay them to get those services. Yeah. I think yeah, I think at the outset, the government has to define what they're going to do with yeah. the data that's being collected. I think we are, uh, we work a lot in the uh, smart city movement, yeah. and there's enormous amount of you know technology that helps cities um, sense the environment, sense the world around them, and collect data. And then you go and you talk to people, they, they're touting you know the new technology deployed, and you say, okay, this is great, and it's collecting all this data. It's like, okay, well, how are you gonna use this data to impact decision-making within yep. the city? And that's often where you have the disconnect. Um, but also, you, yeah, so if you don't sort of set your objectives for what, you're, what you want and how you're gonna you know, use this data to impact decisions, um, it could have a reverse effect. Uh, one of the cities we work with um, in the suburbs of Chicago, um, which, uh, believe it or not, gets colder than New York on an annual basis, um, or for nine months out of the year, um, they had put, uh, they fought, the city fought to get bike paths on some of the major roads uh, within the city, some of the, the major uh, north-south thoroughfares. And uh, there was, you know, kind of areas of public that really supported it, um, and then parts of the public that were really against it, because 
you have the you know cyclists, commuters, millennials, and you have you know the car-based um, uh, residents and um, people are just unfamiliar with changes in the, in the roadway. People just don't like change. And uh, the city said, all right, you know, they fought to get these bike paths. And they wanted more of them. They thought it were positive. It was good for the city. People are using, um, and so they said, we want to uh, now put uh, sensors on our bike paths and track how many bikes are on there. And we had this conversation with them. We said, all right, just think about what you're going to get from that. Um, <laughs> because, you know, think about where you've put them. And like, when, just, think, just put yourself out in, in the environment. 365 days a year where it snows a lot, it's cold a lot, and there are, there are probably big swaths of time uh, during the year where there aren't a lot of bikes on these bike paths. And especially, you know, the bike paths are probably being used for like maybe eight to 10 hours a day. Um, so the majority of the year, the majority of the time that you're gonna be collecting data, um, there's not gonna be a lot of usage. And it's gonna be, you're, you're collecting data to support an argument to not have bike paths in your city. So if you don't really understand what you're trying to, you know, achieve by the collection of data, um, it could it could end up backfiring. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. Not to mention, I think if the city, if if government is going to move into um, the role that the private sector used to play, you know, that has a dampening effect on the private sector wanting to move there. So we're starting to run short on time, but I did want to touch uh, one last topic. We started talking a lot about sensors. We started talking a lot about smart cities. You know, it always raises its head, the question of ethics, the question of, you know, too much surveillance states. And um, so I just wanted the panel to sort of reflect on it. Where do you see the future going as more and more uh, devices are collecting information about us? Um, how do we govern that? How do we think about the ethics of it? I think, Zach, your, your company monitors people and you're, you know, trying to improve productivity <laughs> on the build side. So how do you think about that? Yeah, no, it's it's uh, it's a very interesting question. It doesn't have an easy answer. You know, we collect information on uh, productivity of workers, uh, both individual within a crew, safety track record. You know, does that track record belong to the worker or the company? You know, let's just start there. Um, and and I don't have a good answer for it, but these are the questions that we're going to be forced to uh, to confront as as a society. Um, you know, I have heard of. You know, government legislation being proposed where they're saying any individual's data that they generate online belongs to that individual and needing to create regulation that would allow that individual to be able to have their data swiped, erased from any system. Um, you know, GDPR already has some of that stuff in Europe, so I could, I could see that coming uh, more towards technology space in the United States as well. Um, but there's a lot, of, a lot of unanswered questions that we're going to be uh, confronted with over the course of the next couple of years with respect to data ownership and privacy. Yeah. And that's just data in the workplace. There's then data in the city. It's like biking along a bike path. Mm -hmm. The government knows that you've been biking along a <laughs> bike path. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think uh, you have to establish uh, whose interests are you, are you working for? Or whose who's, uh, interests are you working are you Are you considering when you're making these decisions? So if you're a city employee, um, you... You know, I think with you know, city employees really work in the best interest of the city. Or they, mm -hmm. they really should be. Um, and uh, some of them work in the best interest of themselves, but that's you know, really my hometown <laughs> of Chicago. But uh, the, uh, you know, I think that um, it, it's really sort of finding um, suppliers, finding vendors, finding you know, people that, um, that are, or they can do business with the city that are, will have that agreement with you as well. Ethically, will be operating in the best interest of the client. Well, and I think at the end of the day, the public votes, right? Yeah. And, and you, if, you, if this is something you value, and I think it's something we should all value, then you've got to vote for people who are going to protect the rights of individuals and not let our data be used against us. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think I feel very responsible about that at buildings, but at the end of the day, I have a boss, and my boss has a boss, and my boss's boss's boss is, you know, all of you guys. So... I think it's, um, it should be a platform that we, we all care about because I think that you know, the more data that's available, the more scary the world seems to get. Wonderful. <laughs> and on that note, I want, to thank our, I want to thank our panel very much for joining us today. And thank you, guys. Thank you.